So today we discuss uh, two discussion we have um, access of uh, we take us through uh, the basis of um, uh, of interrogation. So we'll just look at it quickly through this uh, um, outline: anatomy, indication, uh, techniques of subclavian access, the tip and the tricks of subclavian access. Then we go into uh, the conclusion. Now. Now, when you look at the anatomy, the first thing that uh, every person who wants to do cardiac devices is the, as the choose of an access. The access is, is the key. It's like the rate limited step to every device that you want to implant. So you must consider your access very carefully and before you go ahead to implant your device. Most devices are being implanted from the left side, because most of us are right-handed and usually implanted from the non-dominant hand. But there are indications where someone will not receive a device from the uh, from the uh, from the left side, uh, from the left uh, shoulder. Rather, it will be from the right shoulder. Uh, one of them is that if there is an infection. Or the anatomy is uh, is, uh, is there are a lot of uh, um, uh, congenital abnormality in the uh, in the anatomy around that region that we uh, uh, choose your choice of moving the device to another uh, another region. And if you use the uh, either the right or the left shoulder is not working, you can you also have another access again for transvenous using. Uh, the uh, transfemoral and the lower abdomen. I've been privileged to be part of such an implant when I was in India. So looking at the basic anatomy here is that uh, the, the, the axillary vein uh, continue as the, uh, uh, the, the subclavian vein. And the subclavian vein is divided into two parts. The extra thoracic, which lie on uh, on the first rib and the intrathoracic, immediately the end of the first rib, the, the media part of the first rib, uh, uh, the end of the media part continue as the intrathoracic. So uh, the, the, uh, the axillary vein join, sorry, the, the subclavian vein join the, um, the internal jugular vein to form uh, either the right or the left brachiocephalic vein which now join together to form uh, the superior uh, vena cava, which drain it to the heart. So the, the another thing again to, uh, to note in the anatomy is that the vein runs uh, uh, close to the artery, but from anterior to posterior, the vein is anterior to the artery. So these things must be noted carefully when you are operating and when you want to take and access. The another, another key thing is that the closer you get to the clavicle, the, um, uh, the, the media end of the clavicle, the vein become more of a uh, superficial, more of, uh, more of a little bit superficial, why the artery become uh, more of a little bit deeper. So this is also the anatomy of uh, the veins and other various veins that also drain into uh, the end either the subclavian vein or uh, the directly into the superior vena cava, a key example of them is the exigous vein. You must also notice note it. For example, people with um, uh, chronic uh, renal disease and uh, many other chronic conditions have failure. Most of all these, um, uh, most of all these uh, veins, uh, which drain the, uh, which drain the, uh, <clears throat> which drain the hepatic system, uh, we become more prominent and they drain all manner of things within the uh, body. So here is uh, uh, the conference of Korogov. Uh, uh, conference of Korogov simply means the point where the, the two um, bronchocephaly vein met to form uh, the, uh, the superior uh, vena cava. So looking at the, uh, the vein, you can see here, there are so many things uh, in this diagram. But what I want us to bring up here is that you can notice that the clavicle is here, 
Yeah, you can see my cursor around the clavicle is pure, purely labored here. Yeah? Then you can see the vein and the artery just posterior to it. And a little bit, uh, the vein a little bit bigger uh, than the artery. So these are things that form your choice of anatomy. One, get closer, while we still describe when you are talking about the landmark, where you have the media to talk. So get closer to the clavicle and the way you should go to uh, do your various uh, uh, punctures. So what are the actual indications for uh, subclavian access? Uh, subclavian access is one of the, se uh, the, the cent uh, central venous as uh, access. Apart from the subclavian access, if you are doing a central, uh, central line of uh, uh, catheterization, you can also use the internal jugular vein or the femoral vein. These are the key things that we use for central line catheterization. Many other reasons that make you to use it, not just only pacemaker, you can use it for a central, uh, a central venous pressure monitoring. You can also use it for uh, administration of multiple uh, drugs and drips, like even amiodaron, um, IV amiodaron is best given through the central uh, vein. Then also, um, uh, this uh, popular drug we usually use, um, adenosine, is also best given through the central uh, vein. Then high volume fluids, for those that needed resuscitation, you also best give them via there. Then emergency venous access, you, it's, it's good that you go for, this, uh, for the central veins and they give you a good way out, especially when you know the anatomy. Then also, uh, inability to get uh, uh, peripheral access is another key thing that also helps us. Then, uh, repeat, people also use it for uh, venous sampling. Uh, then, uh, people also use it for, uh, uh, apart from medication, especially all these anti cancer medications uh, that, that can be used, dialysis that can be used. Uh, we talked about pacemaker, and um, these are all the reasons. For, uh, for central venous uh, access. Now, as, uh, 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 the going through a central venous access, like the subclavian vein, is not without any complication. The commonest complication you usually notice on the subclavian vein puncture is uh, either hemorrhage or pneumothorax. These, uh, these are the commonest complication, but in a in the hands of a very experienced operator, these complications are less than uh, 0.1%. So thrombosis can also be there. Arrhythmias and arterial puncture is also another common thing that people also see in, um, in all this, uh, um, <clears throat> in central uh, venous access. Now, what are the techniques that we use as we're not coming back into uh, um, uh, access for cardiac devices. What are the techniques that we can use for cardiac devices? I will, dis I will start with the ones that we don't use commonly here, then end up with the one that we use commonly here. Now, number one is ultrasound guided. Ultrasound guided is a key thing. Let me just show it here. I listed about six of them. We have the ultrasound guided. We have the fluoroscopy guided. We have the, veno, uh, the venography, sorry for all the mistake in spelling here, uh, the venogram guided, <clears throat> the, blind, <clears throat> the blind puncture uh, using uh, landmarks, and the uh, coronary wire assisted can also be done, or a combination of any of these can be used uh, during the procedure. So in the ultrasound guided, either you do it from uh, from the left or from the right uh, subclavian, the first thing that you do here, you can see the probe at the corner here. You take the probe the way it is, uh, looking towards the shoulder as uh, a linear probe, and scan it through. You will see the vein uh, running through. And while doing that, you may also see there is um, uh, the shiny layer that you see around here. This big uh, hypoechoic lesion here, this is the vein. Why this is the artery. Then you see a shiny layer around here. This is, uh, the, uh, this is the plural space. So that that guides you. An ultrasound help you and guides you that you should not go beyond that plural space. Because if you go beyond that plural space, you are likely going to cause 
cause hemothorax. And as you scan the, uh, the ultrasound through, you will see that how the vein moves and how you, you now go into, uh, then turn the, uh, the, uh, the marker towards the head uh, to slot it into a long longitudinal view. And when that is done, you now take your puncture and direct your puncture. The body key thing about this is that when your needle is going through the tissue down, the tip of that needle should be captured by the uh, by the ultrasound. If the tip of that needle is not captured, you just withdraw it back and take on uh, take a direction where you'll be able to see it uh, being captured. You can see the plural line here, which I talked about. Then above that is the uh, is this uh, subclavian vein. Then uh, just posterior towards the subclavian vein, you have the uh, the artery in that line. So ultrasound guided is quick and is simple, and uh, it, uh, it, it gives you a very quick delivery, and it gives you where it tells you where when you uh, you land into the vessel, you visualize it purely, and your procedure can be done easily. So this is what I talked about as the the subcranial vein. This is the uh, the longitudinal view. And when you go into the longitudinal view, you have to slice as your needle goes in, you should be able to see the tip of the needle. That is the key thing for this puncture. If you are not seeing that tip of that needle, withdraw it back and advance it along the, the line of the ultrasound for you to visualize it so that one, once you get into the vein, you know that you have entered into the vein. So this is a demonstration where the ultrasound is already positioned and the needle is going be, uh, beneath the ultrasound, advancing it carefully to, uh, to puncture uh, the vein. You can see, yeah, where the puncture is made, here is the, uh, the outline of the needle. You must see the tip of that needle as it uh, transit into the vein. So these are the things that guide us in ultrasound uh, guided. It's simple, it's easy, and it, the complications are far less and, and you have a safe way to go if you are using ultrasound guided. Then the second thing that we, uh, that we also use in puncturing the subclavian uh, vein is the fluoroscopy guided. Now, the first thing I want to say, the key thing about the fluoroscopy guided is that one, you must know the first read. Just um, uh, uh, scrub the patient, that is the first thing. Once you scrub the patient, obey all the sterile techniques, then scrub um, the uh, the CM, then what, sorry, we had the sterile uh, uh, band on the CM, then uh, vertically, the CM looked at the first rib. You can see it here. This is the first, the first rib is here. See the clavicle, the first rib, now that first rib, when you're on the first rib, you can see the first rib and the second rib. At the point of the first rib, there are key things we must note. The, uh, it is expected that the vein runs, that is the subclavian vein, runs through uh, on top of the first rib, very just beneath the clavicle. So advance your needle vertically. Those are the key words. Vertically, this is the, the common uh, access uh, uh, technique that is being used in Europe currently. Advance your needle uh, vertically until you hit the uh, the first rib, and when you hit the first rib, then you you create a vacuum. Then aspirate, uh, create a vacuum as you aspirate. Then gently withdraw it stay in that vertical position, almost near vertical position, gently withdraw it. And as you gently withdraw, you see a tinge of blood that just enter into it. And when that happens, then take out, the, uh, take out the syringe and advance your wire. In, in more than 95% of time, you will enter into the vein and you will not have any problem in either a second or a third puncture of any kind if this procedure 
uh, if you have a very good knowledge of this procedure. So that is a key thing. I've explained the key things about it. Vertical, under fluoroscopy, locate the first rib, locate the clavicle, and you notice where the, uh, the clavic, the first rib, be, a little become vertical immediately after he transcend below the clavicle. That is where the uh, the uh, the subclavian vein is. And as I said, don't puncture below the first rib. Advance it until you hit the first rib vertically under fluoroscopy. Once you hit it, then you are you you take your your you 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 apply your your vacuum aspirate, then gentle withdraw. Then a tinge of blood, which a tinge of venous blood, we just enter them. Take out the, uh, the 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 syringe and advance your guide wire. In more than ninety five percent of time, you will get it once. So that is the key thing for this uh, puncture. Then the the venogram and the venography is this. Now the venogram is that um, I remember in uh, when I was still training in India. Uh, where I was in Apollo Hospital, we usually do a venogram before we start, we take any puncture. So the venogram, if you are your center, is the one that does venogram with what I describe as under fluoroscopy puncture, they are all similar. So you can even try it, get a venogram, see where the subclavian vein go through, then take uh, the floral, uh, the uh, on, uh, under fluoroscopy puncture, you will notice that that vein goes through the same point that we just described above. So see the first rib here, see the first rib under the venogram, then see the clavicle. So you can see where that first rib is, just at that point, very close by, advance, just take your needle here vertically to that point and puncture. But on that venogram, you have seen it, on, on venogram, while the venogram is going on, you can even puncture direct, you can puncture the axillary vein. And the beauty of getting into the axillary vein, you will have no uh, nemotoras or hemotoras in a uh, puncturing axillary vein because you didn't really enter into uh, the plural space. That is one of the key things that we must uh, uh, realize from this discussion. So you can see the first rib here. Well, I've talked about this first rib here, axillary vein. Axillary vein uh, uh, is a continuation of the bronchus uh, of the breaker vein, and the breaker vein, uh, uh, sorry, breaker vein continues axillary vein, and axillary vein stop at the point of the first rib, and throughout the uh, length of the the, uh, the the horizontal length of the first rib, the vein that lie, the part of the vein that lie on it is the extra uh, thoracic. Uh, as <clears throat> extra thoracic subclavian vein, and that is the point of our puncture. If you are going for it, or either by fluoroscopy or by venous puncture, you can also try it. Um, do a venous puncture, combine venous and fluoroscopy. You will have fantastic uh, result. Then the other method which uh, I also want to describe here is uh, uh, the method of what we call, what we describe as the blind method use, uh, using the uh, the landmarks. Now, the issue of, about blind method, this is the first method uh, that have been invoked before all these other methods start coming up. This blind method is still commonly used in the sub-Sahara Africa. Now, <clears throat> I want to advise on some issues about the blind method. Number one, you must know your anatomy. That is one key thing about the blind method. You must be very vast in your, in your anatomy. There may be variation, yes. But if you know your anatomy and the landmark very well, you won't have problem of having either a nemotoras or hemotoras with blind method. It will be very, very minimal. Then two, um, there are two ways to get the blind method done. You can have an access before you create your pocket. I usually advise that. But some people are training centers where the access is created. The, uh, you, cre you create the, the, the pocket 
before you get an access. So whatever method that you are familiar with, the description is similar. But let me take the one of getting an access before creating a pocket. What you do here is this. Once you scrub the patient and you prepare the patient sterilely, the first thing you will do is that take your lidocaine. I usually use lidocaine, 2% lidocaine with adrenaline. Inject deep. That is the key thing here. Inject deep because I usually train my fellows that there are two ways to inject this lidocaine, the deep and the superficial. So your aim of injecting deep is that you numb all the area at, at, uh, 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 going towards the, the clavicle and also inject around the periostrum of the clavicle. So when you have done that, then as a beginner, you can get the lama. Put one of your, your index finger at the sternal launch, then your, your thumb at the um, anterior to third of the clavicle. You will see a straight line that connects the two together. So when that has been identified, I'm describing as, it as, as for a beginner, when that has been identified, the second thing you will do is that put some saline in your syringe and enter into, uh, into under the skin with your needle, your puncture needle. Then advance the needle. Just mark that line, advance the needle. That is the key word. Advance the needle to hit the clavicle. If you try it tomorrow, you get it. This procedure, I do it every day. So that is a keyword. Advance the needle to hit the clavicle. Needle hit the clavicle. We draw the needle. And then put some pressure on the needle so that horizontally it goes beneath the clavicle. Just a little pressure on it horizontally, it just and just horizontally go towards the stellar launch of the other hand. In that process, you are going to hit the subclavian artery in most time. The key thing here to avoid pneumothorax and hemothorax is that the needle should go horizontal on the plane of your of your advancement should be horizontal that is how the needle should go the needle should not go oblique while going deep down no horizontal that is the key thing if you try it once you don't get it a little bit horizontal just manipulate it around you will get it there very fast so why we take a little time to describe it is that this is the most common method that is being used in the Sub-Saharan Africa. It is not only uh, cardiologists that implant devices. The surgeon implant devices. Most time when the surgeon implant, they use more of either the cephalic or the axillary vein. But most time when the cardiologists implant, they use more of either the axillary or the extrathoracic uh, subclavian vein. So this is how the variations are. And since I've been doing it, I've not gotten anyone hematoma or pneumothorax. So you can see the outline here. You put your hand, just the supra sternal lodge. Then you see the dead toy groove here. Then you are just anesthetize deep along this tract. Ensure that your needle actually go deep so that you numb that distance down. Then take your, your index finger on the stellar launch, then your, uh, your, um, your tongue, your tongue can be at the two third and, and uh, the media two third of the clavicle and just navigate, ensure that that needle is always horizontal. Doing that, most time you are going to puncture that vein. Then, if you are the type that like creating a pocket, 
before getting an access is that once you create that pocket and you want to get an access from a pocket, you have already created a depth. So you don't need to move that needle in, uh, in, in, in any form of oblique. Just take that horizontal step, that horizontal, because uh, after the skin, you, talk, you come to this, uh, the subcutaneous layer, then the fatty layer. After the fatty layer is the, is the, uh, the, the fascia that, uh, that overlies the uh, uh, P major. Now, the depth will depend on the level of fat that patient has. There are some patients that don't have enough fat, so you have them, you don't have that, that very deep depth. Why some have so much of fat and they have a lot of depth? So whatever you are dealing with, ensure that that needle go, go horizontal to hit the clavicle, then navigate it when you are creating it, when you are taking the access from the pocket. Those are the key things. And still follow the same landmark as we described. Those are the key things that we must note. If you have a problem in creating a pocket, you advance one, you didn't get it. The second you didn't get it, I will advise that you do a venogram so that you see the nature of the vessel that goes through there. Now, the advantage, the advantage of taking a puncture before a venogram is this. Uh, sorry, uh, taking a puncture before creating a pocket is this. If you take a puncture or an access before you create a pocket, once you take the access, you, you looked at the curvature of how the, how the, how the guide wire transverse crosses from the left to the right through the bronchocephalic vein. All these things help you because after you create the access, you look at it on the floor again to see where your guide wires are. So that helps you and give you more confidence that you are in the vein. But there are some situations where the, the left sub, uh, subcravian uh, vein is not obliterated, but persisted. And when you create an, when you take a puncture, <laughs> you just see that the wire goes down and uh, goes straight and go down and enter into the liver. And it does it does it transverse the normal uh, the normal J curve that we go through from the left to the right. You will get it. So if that exists, what you can do here is this: you can leave the wire there, then take an angiogram if you want to be sure of where you are and you can take an angiogram and you you will see that you are in uh, uh, you are in the coronary sinus because if there is a persistent uh, left superior vanai cover it, it drains directly into the coronary sinus but that could have been sorted out if you are doing a, a pre procedure if you are doing a, a, a echo you look out for the coronary sinus. If the coronary sinus is abnormally large, suspect um, a, pers a left persistence uh, SVC. Suspect that for such group of people. So these are some of the things. Maybe during questions, we may be able to answer many of the questions. Then another key thing, another advantage of uh, doing a venogram before you take any procedure is that if there is a persistent left SVC, the venogram will show you. You will, not, you will notice that as the drainage comes, it drains directly into the coronary sinus. It doesn't cross to the, to the right side of the patient. It just drains directly. So you will see the outline draining directly. So you can move to the other, to the right, and take your punctures from there and move on. But there are some people that we also implant, even when they see a persistent um, uh, a persistent left SVC draining to the coronary sinus. So if you can do that, what are the things required? Do you have the hardware? Do you have the extra equipment to maneuver and implant your devices? If you are doing um, a CROT, it's very easy because you just straight away enter the coronary sinus. You don't need to look for a coronary sinus. Then just take your, 
uh, inner uh, guide and uh, look for where the posterior lateral vein is and implant is very simple. But if you are doing a single chain, I mean, sorry, a pacemaker, and you want to enter into, uh, you want to enter into the uh, into the ROV, you may have some little challenge. That is all. Okay, so this also tells us the same direction that we have been describing the subclavian uh, vein, the subclavian artery. But I want to say it here that if by mistake, as you are you are advancing you mistakenly puncture the subclavian artery. There are key things to know it. One, the brightness of the blood. Two, the force. The force of the, the, of, of the pressure that will come that's, as you take out your, your, syri your syringe, the, uh, the syringe, the, 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 the force, the force, because arterial force is what, arterial pressure is what you are going to notice there. So the force of pressure that will come out so that tells you that you are in the artery. Don't panic. If you miss out, inadvertently puncture that at once, don't panic. What you do is that just direct the, the needle more, just withdraw a little back, then direct anteriorly. more Because it shows that you went too more posterior. Direct a little anterior, you will puncture the vein. The same thing. So these are the key things that we should note when doing our punctures. So what are the tips? Uh, uh, before we discuss the tip, there is one I talked about uh, assessing uh, using coronary wires. Yeah, if you set uh, if you set uh, a line at the cubital level or the uh, or the or the brachiocephalic vein, you can actually pass a coronary wire through that line. And it transverse all the way, and it gives you a way to go about and look at the direction of the vein because the coronary wire can transverse through there and get to the right side of the heart. So that is another way, but it's very rare. Nobody uses that. So the key thing is that either you use blind, you use uh, fluoro, you use ultrasound, or you use a combination of all this together. So what are the tips? The landmark. You must learn the landmarks. You must know the landmark and you must feast your eyes on the landmark. Then two, the use of micro puncture needle. In the US, that is what they use. Whether you are doing blind puncture, you are doing um, a fluoroscopic guided puncture, you are doing a, um, a, ve a venogram uh, directed puncture, you must use the, uh, what to call micro puncture needles. I remember in Bayasa, uh, I use them a lot there because doctor usually bring them from the US. So micro puncture needles are key thing because if you puncture the artery or you inadvertently puncture anything that you, it's supposed not to be punctured, micro puncture needle will save you from having um, a bleeding or pneumothorax. So after you use the micro puncture needle, you can now change over to your regular uh, device system and you can now move on with it. So my, another key thing is another tip that we should also go home with that master each techniques and know it very well. Don't rush to learn technique, don't rush to learn everything without knowing one very well. You can learn the, um, in sub saharan Africa, I will advise you, learn the, uh, the blind puncture and be a master of it. Then two, the fluoroscopy and be a master of it. Then three, uh, the venogram and be a master of it. If these three, fine. Then follow the rules that guide each technique. If you are using fluoroscopy, follow the rules. Remember it has to be vertical and you must hit on top of that first rib. Don't puncture beyond it. Vertical, almost vertical, and direct it. Then, when it gets to the rib, before you now create a vacuum and suck back, in order then we draw gently. A tinge of blood will enter. Once that enter is enough, stop. Take out the needle and advance your wire. You, you will get in there. Okay. So now, looking at the comparison of commonly used central venous access routes. 
the axillary, the axillary access uh, gives us the risk of pneumothorax zero. Please forgot this uh, less than 0 0.1. Risk of pneumothorax is zero. Uh, cephalic, yeah, less than one. Why the conventional uh, is between one to two? So it depends on which one you want to use. Then we also look at the risk of arterial puncture in uh, uh, in as uh, in the extra sub uh, extra thoracic subclavian and axillary. It is uh, it is very low. Why the conventional conventional subclavian is using the, the blind method using the landmark. Obviously, risk of arterial puncture. The, the, the source I checked said it is high, but what I will confidently say here is this. It depends on the experience. For a very experienced person, it's not high, but for beginners and low volume centers, definitely high. But if you try it and you have it, as I told you, don't panic. Just withdraw a little back. Don't withdraw the entire needle out, entire puncture needle out. Withdraw a little back and direct more anterior. You will get it. Okay. So uh, we also look at risk of lead uh, 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 lead crush. Yeah, uh, is hey, is highest. Doctor. Yeah. While you're on the subject of arterial access, um, I will. Do you have any suggestions about looking at the fluoroscopy to see if you're arterial as far as, you know, not taking the SVC route? And then um, just from my own, you know, what I've heard in the field, I haven't actually personally experienced this, but if you do have arterial mm -hmm. access and you put a guide sheath in, don't panic, don't pull the guide sheath out because right. uh, until you until you have support from closure or somebody from, else who can help you. Yeah, from the surgeon, correct. Exactly. Yeah, because if you good. pull that guide out, it's almost impossible to hold pressure and the patient can bleed out, which uh, I've heard of happening. 100% correct. Seen. Yes. It's good you raise this up. If you have an arterial puncture, it's good that you raise it. Thank you very much, AJ. If you have an arterial puncture, assuming you, your, needle, your, your needle goes into the subclavian artery and you put your guide wire in, one thing I usually say that help us prevent that is this. Once the guide wire goes in and the needle comes out, always check the direction of your guide wire. Assuming you didn't notice that, because before then you should check all this thing, the, the, uh, the venous blood is darker than arterial blood. Arterial blood is red. Then two, the force of venous blood, as if there is, you are not in the vein when you take out some of them, as if you are not in the vein. I did a, pro, I did a procedure today after church. I did a dual chamber pacemaker today after church. I was in the vein. I was telling my, my, my assistant that look at it. I picked out, I removed the needle. Uh, sorry, I removed the syringe and looked at it. I said, there is no drainage here, but there, we are in the vein. We, passing our wires and it goes well. So once some people still have, maybe the pressure may be a little bit high, so you have it draining out more. But what, even with all that, you must look at the direction of, the direction of, of connection of that wire. If you didn't go from the left to the right and goes into the right side of the heart and it goes, right from the left, it transverse from the left and enter into the heart. You must check further before you make any dilatation. And if by mistake, you, as the, uh, uh, AJ pointed out, you make a mistake to, uh, uh, to put a sheet on it, please don't take that sheet out. You have to get the help because if the, there are a lot of uh, bones around here, you cannot hold pressure. Don't take that sheet out. Wait for help. And when the help come, before you can take that sheet out. And the surgeons have to be available. OK. So uh, looking at the various incision, the commonest incision we usually do around here, AJ, is, uh, uh, is our 
transverse incision, but you have all manner of incision that are described in the book. So any incision that you are used to, please stay with it. But most time uh, for uh, subclavian uh, access, transverse incision is usually what is recommended. So blind puncture method you, uh, using the anatomy is the most common method that are still used in the sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but we should learn the other methods that are uh, that are now used in Europe and also in America, especially the fluoroscopy and also the um, this um, the, the, the venogram uh, method. We should learn all of them. So in our center, we usually use a combination. Can use a fluoroscopy. Can, once I once we puncture once and we didn't get it, then fluoroscopy coming and the fluoroscopy. Uh, most time we will get it VM. Hardly do we do venogram. So this is hard. But if fluoroscopy fails, then we we'll go into venogram. So I think this is the little discussion we have today. Uh, AJ may take his home before we get our questions. Thank you very much. AJ, over to you. Yeah, so I guess before we completely switch subjects, I I appreciate this is fantastic. You going through all this. I think I interrupted you when you were mentioning um, like Clavian crush and lead issues. Were you yes. able to shed some light on that for like the subclavian access has a higher instance? Rate yes, if you look very good. If you look at uh, uh, risk of lead crush here, is is highest with the conventional subclavian. Uh, as uh, access because the conventional one is the blind one you just take and you move you don't know at what point you puncture that particular um you puncture the particular vein that is one then two uh another thing again that we should also take from it is that if the clavicle is big because it depends on the space between the clavicle and the and the vein if the clavicle, there are some people that have bigger, some people have bigger clavicle than others. If the patient has a very big clavicle and you notice it on time, I usually advise that either you do an axillary access for such group of people, or you can uh, get the surgeon to be with you and do a cephalic. The issue with the cephalic uh, is that it cannot take many leads, uh, cannot take many leads, and you may have some issue in uh, passing the lead because it's a small vein, and also the angulation of this uh, of the cephalic vein to um, uh, to the mainstream vein. If it is so much angulated, you may have some issue in passing it. That is just uh, what I want to put. Maybe AJ, you may have uh, something to say here. No, that's that that's dead on. Um, so yeah, exactly. With the cephalic. You know, I'm, I'm not the access guy. I just observe a lot of accesses, but it, it's smaller to work with. Um, and then sometimes, I don't know if you hit on this, but people will do cephalic uh, cut downs or even like an axillary yes, cut correct. down to the, to the vein itself. Um, yes, those are lower risk as, you know, or no risk as far as pneumo, but obviously it's a little more in depth and you have to put little purse strings to cut off the blood flow to those veins so they don't bleed out while you're working on it. You are right. No, I, th I think that's great. Um, just the reason why Dr. Dafe is talking about subclavian crush being a risk for those who don't know, I would just Google subclavian crush and pacemakers. But uh, with devices over time, the clavicle can actually cause uh, stress to either the insulation and breach the insulation um, or cause uh, conductor fracture inside the lead itself, which can affect your ability to capture, uh, can cause oversensing. There's a number of different issues that it causes, and it's one of the most common lead issues we'll see is if you get subclavian access and you just happen to be um, your access points a little too close to the clavicle, it can cause trouble over time, which is why sometimes having a more lateral access can be beneficiary, beneficial there. AJ, somebody raise a hand. Yeah. What, uh, what question do we have? There's somebody, she goes there, raise a hand. His hand is raised up. You can see yes, sir. it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daffy. And, uh, thank you, sir. Doctor, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Please, I just want a few clarifications. One is, you know, you are talking about uh, the direction of the puncture being vertical. 
when you are describing, uh, I think the fluoroscopy uh, guided access. I wanted to know what you mean by vertical. You know, I thought uh, it was supposed to, really, yeah, like you said, target the clavicle, then come out a little and go under mm -hmm. it on that portion. So I wanted to know what you mean by. Hello. Dr. Duffy, I think we're losing you a little bit there. Question. AJ, did you get the question? Yeah. Did you get oh, the sorry. question? Uh, yes, yeah. sir. So he, I don't know if you heard him, but basically what he's saying is vertical access versus more, um, you know, lat more lateral. Horizontal. Yeah, yeah, yeah horizontal. horizontal. That's what I was no, looking I, for. I, yes. Yeah. What I said about the vertical is that if you are using, fluor if you are doing fluoroscopy, if you are taking fluoroscopy access, you, you advance the needle vertices, you will first of all take, create your pocket, create your pocket, then take the, uh, take the needle vertical to hit the clavicle, the point, the landmark of that clavicle, sorry, to hit the first rib, not the clavicle, hit the first rib. So once you hit the first rib, don't go beyond the first rib. Then you create a vacuum. The gentle withdrawal, the needle, sorry, into the syringe on a gentle withdrawal. Blood goes into the syringe, then take that the syringe and advance it. That is for the, the techniques of the fluoroscopy assets. The horizontal is when you are doing your blind uh, blind access using landmark. You must keep that needle horizontal. Don't keep it vertical. If you keep it vertical, you will definitely going to cause either nematuras or hematuras. Keep it horizontal and advance it to hit the clavicle. Once it hit the clavicle, withdraw a little and go horizontal below the That is the key word. Withdraw, a little withdraw, then take a little pressure. And very poor. On your, 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 your sternal launch and the media third of the clavicle. That is for the blind method using landmarks. Okay, th th thank you, sir. Then se secondly, I want to know, please, what yeah. are the possible limitations of uh, uh, doing uh, uh, securing of cleaver access in the absence of a cat lab? Let's, you know, there's some people that uh, use, I think, just a C arm or so. A C arm to mm -hmm. implant. Yes, yes that is what I see. Yes, if you, don't, if you don't have cat lab, how, which, which is the best approach to use for? puncture very good you mentioned all this most of the pacemaker that are implanted in nigeria today are not done inside the cat lab many of them because it's not only the cardiologists that implant pacemaker the uh, cardiothoracic surgeon also implant pacemaker in the country so many people do implant pacemaker in the country so one thing I will say here is that the commonest method that is currently being used in the country is the, uh, is the blind method using landmark. If you are uh, experienced with each method, that was why towards the end of the, uh, of the talk, I was talking about each method, you must learn it and be vast in it. If you are vast in the blind method, more than uh, more than 90% of or 95% of time you will get your access once or twice approaching it so it's for you to be versatile in it the commonest one is the blind method using the landmark that is still what we use currently uh, in the sub saharan africa but even with your cm sorry with your cm you can actually uh, 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 you can actually put uh, a, a sterile cloth or a sterile uh, polythene, uh, 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 polythene on the CM, and you can also take the same method of a fluoro 
because you it's just for you tell your operator to move the CM to the right location where it will beam on the clavicle and the first rib and give you a space for you to manipulate your hand vertically and go down and pick uh, and take your access. That can be done. There's no problem with that. And when you're talking about a C-arm or a cath lab, you're generally focusing on an AP view, uh, correct? Yes, Dr. AP view. Yes. Oh, yes, AP view. All of them are done in AP views. So one of the things Correct. you had mentioned as far as the vertical access, I, I think is you're using that rib as a backboard. So uh, yes. that's why, that's you why hit you're the rib. able to- Vertically, mm -hmm. you go down, vertically mm -hmm. go down and hit the first rib at the point where it may contact with the clavicle. Mm -hmm. Hit the first rib. Then when you hit it, then you now apply uh, a vacuum. Then we draw a little, you just see blood going in because that is where mm -hmm. most time that is where that vein passes through. More than 98% of the time you will hit the vein once and you move on. Mm -hmm. So I, I just had yeah. a couple more things uh, to add before we switch subjects. And if you have more questions, please jump in. But you talked about, you know, doing the pocket first. One thing I would say is if you're not experienced with access, I would avoid making the pocket before you get access. Um, I've right. seen a I've seen a physician that had that struggled with access, and they would send other hospitals with bilateral pockets and no access. Oh my God. <laughs> so maybe just they switch the other side, he do a pocket, and still couldn't get access, and the patient comes across, you know, and then we're like, okay, we know who did this one. You're right. Uh, so You're right. Struggle with my, access. In my practice, in my yeah. practice, I I take the the access first before creating the pocket. Yeah, there are reasons for that. I want to know where those uh, those uh, um, uh, I want to know where the uh, where the uh, the guide wire goes to mm. because I'm yeah. not uh, most time I don't do the venography so I want to know where the guide wires go to so that I'll be sure I'm in the right mm. location before I go and create a pocket. That's that's a really good point too, because you could end up having to go to the right side, right? If you've already made the pocket on the left, now now you have a pocket that is not even viable. So if you're not doing a venogram, I think that's a really good point. Is probably don't right. do the pocket. If you do a venogram, All you know right. it's open and you're confident. Yes, then fine. Yes, but... if you are doing the venogram, you are confident that mm. you will transverse through the right room, so you can create pocket and move on. Very correct. Good learning as points. Far... Thank as you. far as helping patients out, um, you know, if they're if they're low on fluid, you could try giving them fluid or lifting their their legs as well to increase um, blood to the uh, you know to the more superior part of their system, so you have better access as well. Do you have any other suggestions aside from fluid and lifting legs for access issues? Uh, the issue is this: if, um, you know, as uh, as. You, the more experience we get with this as, uh, access uh, uh, access into the vein, uh, mm -hmm. the less you are being traumatized. Uh, one is that some people suggest that you you turn you turn the uh, the patient towards your side, where that the vein be, fills up and all those stuff. I don't do them. Uh, I have done. I don't do them. I, I punch on once and move on. And one key thing is that. There are some veins, like the case we did today, when we will enter into the vein, if you are not careful, you will know you are not in that vein. You will know that if you are not careful, you will think that you are, you are not in the vein. Just a small thing of blood that came out, I knew that was already in the vein because I tracked through the right direction. I knew that was there. So I just take the needle out and pass the wires and everything was fine. So if you, uh, if you are still a young operator, what I will advise is that you can use some of this maneuver. Then two, if the patient is on lasers, you can uh, you can um, you can you can withhold the lasers before you get access, and after access, you give the lasers to the patient. So these are some of the maneuver. You know, the issue here is that uh, if you are doing a pacemaker, you require most time you require just two uh, as, uh, access, or you can get one access and you you turn it into two and you move on. But if you are doing a CROT, you require three accesses, three accesses, and the three accesses are different puncture, especially the LV, uh, the LV lead has to be on its own. Yeah, 
And most time, uh, people require that the LVL comes from the subclavian vein. So if you can, con in that case, you can combine the fluoroscopy and the venogram and you get your way out. So the, the thing here is that the safety of the patient and the happiness of everybody. Yeah, I think I think you made a really good point that the best access point is the one you're familiar with, right? Like if you're very good at yes. one method, you shouldn't necessarily change to another method. Don't you change any house. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I see the hand <laughs> raised. Just one thing you were talking about access points. One thing we you can mention is uh, there is a double barrel technique, and we can go over this in person or with actual, you know, um, with actual sheets mm -hmm. to show you. But there is a double barrel technique where you can uh, double the wires and then pull your sheath out yes. and then put the sheath back over the wire. That allows two um, access in one. Exactly. And there's also yes. a, retained, a retained wire technique, Correct. which is where you'll- uh, For you'll... young operator, hmm. yes. For young operator, I usually advise them, if they have problem with, uh, with access, access hmm. they should do that double barrel technique. Um, you can do it for pacemaker and it's fine, but you can't do it for a CROT. Mm -hmm. A CRT, exactly. the LV lead has to be on a different uh, uh, access on its own. So you yeah. must count all those things so that you don't uh, displace the other lead because the, 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 the advantage of the double barrel technique is number one, you punch on once and it's quick for mm. you to uh, change over, but you lost more blood because in the process of changing over, the ble a patient bleeds. Then secondly, when you, are, uh, when you position the... Uh, arrow V lead, and you want to go with uh, arrow A lead, you may notice that go, you are going through the same point, the arrow V leads may be shifted because you are transversing through the same uh, direction. But it's a very good uh, uh, technique if you have problem in getting uh, the vein. Fantastic. Um, I yeah. think there's one more hand raise. Um, was there anyone else who had a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, please, Chief Edafe. You know, the what we are trying, I, I want you to shed a little more light, you know, on that uh, prevention of lead crush. You know, I discovered that many times after securing a venous access here, you know, the consultant, when he arrives, he will still want to repeat it and reposition to get a separate uh, venous access. Because he's afraid that the um, guide wire is so close to the clavicle or something. Exactly what do you see? And you can you know, rest assured that there is minimal possibility of lead crush. What do you see? Yeah. And the other thing okay. is this. Yes, the, the issue of the double, uh, double barrel uh, techniques, which AJ just talked about, if you are using it, what our advice is that one lead should not be on top of the other leads. Ensure that they are, they are horizontal among, they are horizontal, they lie horizontal. Because what causes a lead crush is that, uh, you know that between the clavicle and, um, and the vein, there is, there, there is a space. So if, the clav if you are dealing with a, some, someone with a big clavicle, uh, that space is reduced. Or if you want one lead transverse on top of the other lead, that is vertical on top of the other lead passing through the clavicle, when the patient will start moving her, when the patient will start moving, you see the distance will reduce and the tendency of a lead crush will occur. So these are the things that you watch out for. That is why experienced operator, when they come, they don't, they looked at the thing and say, no, 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 no take another as, uh, access. For an experienced operator, access may not be a major problem to him. That is why you notice that when the fellow take an access, uh, the, uh, the consultant comes and tell you that, no, 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 we can't take only one, let's take another one. The consultant takes another one because he's experienced with it. So these are the little, little things about the issue of uh, lead crush. They, they should not lie on top of themselves. They should be vertical if you are using the same access to pass two leads. They should be horizontal among themselves. So check out for all those things. Then when you are advancing one lead, uh, after you advance one lead, you want to advance the second lead. 
the first lead should not be uh, should not be so much distorted because these are the things that make lead to coil up and at a point below the clavicle that uh, easily cause a crush on on, uh, on the leads. So these are the things to avoid. Fantastic. I love that input. All right. Um, any other questions from the group at all? Okay. So it, we're already about an hour into this. Um, I was thinking I could do a high level introduction of pacemaker navigation and just the external accessories. And then we'll just leave it at that. And then we can pick it up later for more advanced um, more details. So how about a just a, a high level interrogating a device programmer workshop and then just navigating the programmer if that works for everybody. And then um, if you have specific questions in the meantime, before we have our follow up, you know, reach out to us directly and we can answer it. But if that works, I'll go ahead and get started here. Yeah. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Can everybody see this right here? The uh, programmer on my screen? Ignore my coffee. We can see. Okay, perfect. All right. So this is going to be your standard Abbott um, programmer. This is a 3650, uh, 3650 model. Um, so Dr. Daffy, do you mind actually giving me control as host just so it stays on my screen? Let me... Actually, I've just reclaimed it. Okay, perfect. I got well, that. I, I got that. Have you taken it? Yeah, I got you it. You have it now. Good. good I have good, good. it. Okay. So here's your, your standard 3650 um, Merlin. There may be other ones out there in the market, but as far as I know of, uh, this is the US based model. So you'll have different uh, power cords, but power cord goes in the back here. You can see it. It's already plugged in and running. In this back portion here, is where you'll actually plug in your um, your different wands, which I will show you. You may see what's called a pulse sense analyzer. This guy right here, our uh, PSA is sort of pacing, sorry, pacing system analyzer. Um, but it's it's basically what's used during surgical procedures so that we can uh, regulate the patient's heart. You can also see my dog walking in the background. I apologize. Um, on the back here is you'll actually see a battery port. So. Um, if you ever have worry about losing power during a case, I would highly recommend that you have good batteries in here at all times, just because for whatever reason, if the power cuts out and you're relying on the PSA to regulate the patient's heart rate, you could be in big trouble. Um, inside this hatch portion here, there is a place for all of these wires and or your, uh, your wands. And I'll kind of go through it, but if it doesn't fit, it's in the wrong spot. Um, and we can always, you know, if you have questions, just give us a call. But uh, just wanted to give you those basics here. So if you have your PSA hooked up in the back, you have your standard wads. This will be your induction wand. This is similar to what you'll see in Medtronic and Boston devices, which we will have somebody go through a program or a tutorial at a different time. But uh, this is actually how we communicate through inductive telemetry with the device. All of the devices for the most part on the market have inductive capability, except for the ConfirmRx and JotDX uh, loop recorders. The rest all use induction to communicate if you need to. You also have what's called an RF telemetry wand. So all of, all of our older devices for the most part um, who have remote telemetry options used RF. The newer ones use Bluetooth, and then some are induction only. RF has a higher transmission speed than inductive. So if you have the ability to use one of these, I'd recommend using it. Just keep in mind that pacemakers only uh, have about an hour of RF telemetry a month. Defibrillators have about three hours. So if you run out of telemetry, you, you lose the ability to communicate and it'll have to switch back to inductive. If you see here in this corner, this indicates whether or not wands are hooked up to this device, to this programmer. So this little uh, X through the Bluetooth symbol that means that this little Bluetooth guy is not plugged into one of the USB ports. So I'm actually going to plug this in a USB port and you'll see once it detects the, uh, the dongle, this little red X, if you can see it, will go away, which means we have Bluetooth capability. This allows us to communicate wirelessly with our Galant devices 
And then down the road, you may see it uh, incorporated in pacemakers that you're coming across. But for now, pacemakers um, will use either induction only or RF telemetry for remote interrogation. There are additional USB ports here on this left side of the device, just underneath the flap. I'm not sure if you can really see it, but there is USB if you need it. Um, those are other ways to hook up. Looking at the programmer itself, you have your shock button, just in case you ever need to give emergency therapy with an ICD. If it's a pacemaker, it's not gonna do anything. You have to be actively communicating with the device. You have your emergency VVI button. This will show you your outputs when you switch to emergency VVI. Just keep in mind that it is unipolar. So it's going to use a unipolar pacing. If the device is outside of the body and you hit this button, it's no longer going to be able to capture um, unless it's touching something metal that's touching the body or soaked in a wet rag, possibly. Um, because unipolar, you don't you need to have a closed circuit. If you ever need to run paper, these are your options. The sweep speeds are printed out here. 12 and a half, 25 and 50. Those are just, if you ever hit that button, it will immediately start running paper. The printer is right here. Um, we can go spend all day talking about how to load that up, but just to give you those details. Um, when you actually have a device and a wand is connected, uh, you have the ability to interrogate. You press interrogate right there. It will speak through induction to make the initial connection. Once a connection is made, if you have a remote telemetry wand and the device is capable of communicating through remote telemetry, it will disable the induction wand and it will move to the remote. Um, but that is through the interrogation button. Interrogate monitors, those work for the um, implantable cardiac monitors like the JOT DX or the uh, Confirm RX devices where um, it will actually interrogate uh, using a magnet, which we could go into at a different time. Um, these screens right here will go through when we actually get into a programmer. <coughs> So one thing I wanted to show you, if you have access to one of our programmers, is you have the ability to run through demos here. So if you click on tools, that drop down menu appears. Then if you go to educational materials and then demos, that will allow you to pull up an actual demo of one of our devices. Here, I'm going to choose the Assurity MRI 2272 because it's a pretty simple, basic one you'll see often. That will create a um, a demo interrogation. It will be as close to a real interrogation as you can get without interrogating a real device. It's not going to be a hundred percent, you know, effective as far as you can't do capture threshold tests. Um, but you can see the basic navigation where all the buttons lie and get a good idea on how to navigate through these screens when you have a real patient in front of you. So here, our demo menu, our demo has has pulled up. In this case, it says RF telemetry is enabled. That's because in this scenario, this is actually already plugged into this patient. That's how we're communicating. On the top here, you'll see the two lead uh, EKG on the on lead two. You'll have your marker channel, A sense and V sense right here is what's currently happening. You'll have a sense amp channel. This is the atrial sense amp, a V sense amp channel, and a bipolar channel. Um, if you don't like these settings, personally, when I'm per when I'm interrogating a device, I don't like to use sense amps. You go right here to this button that looks like a little EKG with plus or minus. Here you can change the gains, auto gain, which will just go ahead and auto um, regularize the, the signal. So if you have crazy amplitude signals taking up your whole screen, hitting auto will clean up that signal so it's a little easier to see. If you see here, it's selected to ECG or EKG. Um, you can select which of the uh, leads you'd like to use. Maybe I like one. I'll go ahead and switch to one here, and it automatically go ahead and redoes the gain. Signals here, markers. I always use full markers. This will give you the refractory period timings and full details. I just think it's more useful to see what's going on. Um, we've kind of run through this before, but the number here is your AV delay. The number above is your A to A timing, and the number below is your V to V timing. So in this case, the A to V timing is 227 milliseconds. The A to A timing is 855 milliseconds and the V to V timing is 855 milliseconds. If there's variability because they have PVCs or regular conduction, you will see the A and V have a discrepancy there. But that's just a good way to kind of uh, get a full view of that. Here you have your A sense amp, V sense amp and V bipolar. I don't like to use sense amp, so I'm gonna click on this here and I'm gonna change it to an A bipolar signal. I'm gonna click on V sense amp and I'm gonna change it to a V bipolar signal. 
And then finally, I'm going to put on a unipolar signal. If you're inside the body, unipolar is a good way to, uh, to see what's going on in the heart. One thing I'll warn you is by using bipolars or sense amps, it could look like you're capturing when you're not actually capturing or having an evoked response. It's a lot easier to see what's going on in the heart with the V unipolar tip. Uh, this is a very narrow QRS complex on the V unipolar tip. Typically, you actually see it much wider, um, and it's a good way to indicate evoked response. So now that we have the view that we want, we can see what's going on in both the chambers of the heart. If we had an LV lead, I may turn on a LV tip to CAN instead of unipolar, just so I can see what's going on with that as well. We have a good view of everything. We can start really looking at this device itself. So here's where you'll have your patient information. In this case, our patient's name is Abbott, but you can customize that to whoever you would like it to be. Um, lead information, anything pertinent regarding the implant, and then who's following with this patient. I highly recommend putting lead data in here just because it'll help us later on for gen changes to know what kind of leads they have, how old the leads are, things like that, especially when we don't have a lot of access to patient tracking. So um, <clears throat> implant follow-up, all of that information is available there. Next, you'll have any kind of pertinent notes. This one says this is a demo, but a lot of times if the patient's dependent, I will actually type dependent in there and then I'll highlight for every follow-up. That way, whenever someone first opens up this device, they'll have an alert here that says, hey, um, highlighted here, this patient see note, you click on the note and it says the patient's dependent. Um, it's just a way to kind of, you know, not risk not pacing the patient when you need to. Um, go ahead and click on your alerts. It tells you what needs to be done, device cybersecurity. Um, in a lot of cases, you don't have remote follow-up. So cybersecurity is not a major focus, but it's never a bad idea to have a most updated device you can have. Um, high ventricular rate episodes, anything pertinent that we need to know about would be flagged there as well. So we know our alerts. We'll go ahead and look at this first fast pass screen. This will show you just a high level of everything, your longevity, which is how long the battery is based on current usage. You can click here and drill into that. This will show you your longevity um, voltage drain. You'll tend to see this drop and then it'll follow this pathway over time. So um, it's just a way to kind of monitor what, um, what kind of battery we have left. If you have sudden jumps in this, a good thing is to look at battery current or any kind of drain issues. But if you have questions regarding the battery itself, just give us a call. We're happy to help you out or just message the main group and we can take a look at things. Here we have our test results. These were all run as autos. The little A here, which means there's an auto run test result. If I had manually tested it, that's where they would show up. You have your list of EGMs, including one high ventricular rate EGM. You have your basic programming information, which you can click into these and drill deeper. You have your pacing percentages, which means you know this patient paces 11% of the time in the A, 24% of the time in the V. Finally, you have your, um, art, your atrial... Um, information as far as like a mode switch or any kind of atrial arrhythmia information. So if I wanted to go directly to episodes, I would either click the episodes or I can click here and that will take me to my episodes tab. Here's where I can view any kind of pertinent episodes. Anything that we should know about is going to be highlighted in red, but we also obviously AMS are our mode switches. Um, so if we're looking for AFib, we want to take a look at those. If someone has previously interrogated this device but hasn't cleared out the episodes, you can view those by clicking include old episodes, and these will pop up here. This just means that they've been read at one point, but um, they weren't erased off of the device itself. If you need to just see the ones that are recent, unclick that. So we're going to jump in and look at this high ventricular rate episode. It'll give you the details of the event in question, showing when it was triggered, its total length, um, duration, and then also, you know, how many beats a minute this was going. Um, <clears throat> you can see here you have more Vs than As. Unfortunately, there's not a unipolar um, field, which will usually make discrimination between SVT or VT easier. But in this case, more Vs and As is pretty, uh, pretty straightforward that that has been trickly driven um, and should be uh, monitored, even though it's not necessarily relevant as far as, you know, a getting a defibrillator or anything like that. Uh, let's go to the next episode here. Here you can see they've had some sort of AFib going on. It looks like AFib, not noise, but you never know. You want, might want to look more closely. You can see here in this case, the device starts to track the high atrial rate. When it reaches um, enough to mode switch, it then goes to a ventricular-based timing, 
and allows a patient to induct or to conduct uh, intrinsically. All right, so we've seen that screen. We've seen how to get to episodes. You can click directly um, or click on the other screen. The log screen will give you a list of all the episodes we've seen, breaking them down by type. Um, and then you can also drill in here and see the episodes and actually click into the EGMs from there as well. So there's, there's many ways to get to the same thing, uh, I guess is what I'm trying to show you. So next, say we want to go to their diagnostics. If you click here or click diagnostics, it will jump to our diagnostics tab. Here you can see your atrial heart histograms, um, pacing percentages as well. Here we can see ventricular heart histograms. There could be differences if you're running like a DDI mode or it's a, at a base rate or above the um, max track, max sensor rate. Um, one thing to note here is it's not monolithic. You have a nice you know, sweeping curve that indicates, you know, we're having a good heart rate variability. Um, if you have a very monolithic um, like uh, histogram here where the patient spends all of their time at the base rate, that may indicate they may need sensor driven rate to uh, regulate their heart rate. Mode switch percentage, this will give you a nice uh, chart of their total mode switch. You can see some slight bumps here and here where they've um, had higher uh, instance of high atrial rates. Um, it's important to look at these EGMs and make sure that they're legitimate. So here will take me back to that screen. Um, it could be that they have noise because of subclavian crush or something like that. So always just take a look and make sure they're legitimate if you're about to put someone on anticoagulation. Um, once again, not a physician. So follow any kind of physician direction with that. Uh, finally, exercise and activity. This will give you your daily um, activity as well as uh, it just basically a, a good idea. It's a pretty good indicator. Say if a patient has been sick, you may see a drop off here um, indicating they may not be getting their, their heart rate up. Um, your total daily activity is based upon the sensor monitor and then the heart rate is just based upon their, their age. Um, so we go back to the main screen. We can either go to tests or we can go and directly jump into each individual capture test, sense test, everything like that. I'll tell you the way I like to go about it is I will go to the test screen. I will go to real-time measurements. And if the patient already conducts, then it's very simple. We can just hit update all. So what this will do is it will measure the atrial amplitude. It will then measure the ventricular amplitude and throw those numbers out for us. So in this case, the, a, the P wave was four millivolts. The, uh, the R wave was greater than 12. And then impedances, it gives a sub-threshold pace to get an idea of impedance or resistance on the system. Um, in this case, it's 510 and 530, which are both within range. Once again, though, when you're talking about staying within range, it's important. It's also important to look at lead trends. So if you click on the lead impedance, you can actually see the trend over time. And we can see it's, it's nice and flat here. Same thing, we're going to take a look at the ventricular, we're looking for a nice stable trend. If you're seeing trending up, if you're seeing trending down, that can indicate lead issues and it needs to be monitored, especially in patients um, where you're worried about noise causing inhibition um, or lack of capture or maybe oversensing causing therapy with an ICD. We're back in our test screen. We already have our real-time measurements. Let's go ahead and get our captures here. So tests, capture and sense. Here's where you actually run your capture tests. Your automated test is already on default because it's been programmed on for this patient. You can also do a decrement test by clicking here. Cycles per step is how many times it waits before it drops the rate. Um, and then specifying pulse amplitude or pulse width. We will almost always test based on pulse amplitude, but if you ever need to customize the pulse width, um, you can bump it out here as well as customizing any kind of mode. Um, this demo doesn't do a really good job of doing a capture test, but I will tell you, you wanna pace above the base rate, obviously, because if you're going below the base rate, it's going to just sense the whole time um, and you're not gonna get a real number. And um, so make sure you're above the base rate. If you're looking for atrial capture, things that make it kind of easy are, um, you know, do they conduct? If they actively conduct, then use nice long AV delays and look for the associated ventricular event after each atrial pace. That's a good way to know um, that you're actually capturing the atrium. Once you start V-pacing, it's generally a pretty good indicator you're not capturing the atrium. Here's where you'll select the mode you'll use, the rate you'll use, how long the sense day V delay is, uh, pace day V delay as well, and then the starting amplitude. So if we knew that the starting amplitude in this case was 0.6, we wouldn't start down at 0.5 because we probably won't capture to begin with. 
Um, so just keep that in mind. It will always say the last threshold here. If you manually tested it and you said the threshold was 0.25 in the ventricle, it will save that and show it the next time. If the threshold was actually five, then you might still think that the old capture threshold was, was 0.25 and you'll come in too low and not capture. So always take that with a grain of salt. If it's a dependent patient, I recommend starting or higher outputs or being ready to uh, stop the threshold test right away, just so they don't, um, you know, don't have uh, go without pacing. Really quick, I'll go ahead and show you one. I'll see if it actually runs. I don't think it will. But for this ventricular capture test, for example, I'll go VVI 90 and our starting amplitude will be 1.75, which is above the 1.25. I'll hold the test. If this was a real event, um, it would actually go VVI. In this case, it's actually going DDD. And we're, pa we're pacing. Um, it's actually a pretty good indicator here. I let go when I think I lost capture. And then it will bring up a review screen here. Here you can see that I V-paced. There was an evoked response. I V-paced. There was no evoked response. This was a conducted event, which means I lost capture here. If you click anywhere in this box, but it may be easier just for you to click on the little green flag, that sets your capture loss, which then puts your threshold at 0.25 above that. So I lost capture at one volt, my new threshold is 1.25. So that's your basic navigation for your capture tests, your sensing and your impedances. Those are the real ones you're gonna have to worry about. Um, <clears throat> Everything here, as far as battery and leads, that just gives you your battery information, impedances, uh, sensor. If you wanted to uh, reset the autos for your sensor, I wouldn't worry about that. NIPS is if you ever need to do a non-invasive pacing study. If you're not experienced with doing this, I would highly recommend not doing it, but it is there for people who know how to do a pacing study. And if you do know how and you just need to help navigating a programmer, just let us know. Here you have your modes. Uh, for temporary pacers as well. So you can always go into temporary pacing screens and play around with outputs with anything like that before you permanently program. So we've made it through all of this. Next, we can check, check out our programming parameters by either clicking on the parameter screen or clicking on mode here um, and bringing that up. That'll bring you to your first page, which is Brady. If this was a defibrillator, there would be a tacky screen. Um, Brady is how you see your basic operations, your rates, your delays, capture and sense leads, refractory and blanking, and any kind of mode switch ATAF response. Um, each one of these you can drill into. So for example, we wanna see the mode. Uh, we click on basic operations mode, and here you have the ability to program the mode DDI. Um, if you wanna turn the sensor off, so come up DDDR, you'll just go to sensor and either click it passive or off. For example, if we have a patient coming in for a gen change, um, and we know that they are dependent, we have the ability to go DLO. Um, if we know that um, you know they, they conduct, then you can just go DDI or DDD, uh, but things to keep in mind there. I would not have the sensor on for a gen change because when the device comes out of pocket, it could cause it to pace at a higher rate. Also under your basic operations screen, um, you have your magnet response, which is going to be the magnet mode pacing. You have your V trigger response off. Uh, I don't turn that on unless you have specific reason to do that. Uh, noise reversion, if a patient's dependent, have your noise reversion set to an asynchronous mode. If they're not dependent, that's at your discretion if you wanna leave them at a non-async. Um, but I would say um, you would probably want to have um, either pacing off for non-dependent, uh, but for dependent patients, you want to have asynchronous just so they have that backup pacing. Rates, this is how you customize your rates, your AV delays, any kind of hysteresis that you may have. Um, sorry, not AV delays, uh, your max sensor rates. Delays are here. Here is your paced AV delay. If this was DDD, your sensed AV delay. Um, VIP, this is how you would program VIP on if you were trying to allow, um, similar to what Medtronic calls their MVP. And this is just allowing intrinsic conduction. Um, but if you need to customize this, give us a call and we'll talk you through it. Um, capture and sense, always make sure you have a two to one margin if you're not using autos for your output. So if the threshold was um, was two in, or one in the atrium, then make sure you're at two volts. If you go less than a two to one margin and I program it here, um, you will have, um, well, it's not in this case because it's not a good demo, but it'll it'll be flagged here when it shows you your margin is not ideal. Let's see. Okay, there we go. 
So here I went below margin. It highlights it and says, hey, your margin is only 1.2 to 1. So it's just a little warning here um, to make sure. Just remember outputs in Abbott devices above two and a half volts tax the battery a lot more. So in those cases, playing with the pulse width can help. Once again, call us if you have questions. Auto sensing algorithm versus fixed sensitivity is handled here. Um, just keep a two to one margin at least with your sensing. Um, ideally three to one if you can, but uh, that's just a good way to go about things. Lead information, if a lead is unipolar only or if the bipole stops working, you can switch it to a unipolar um, programming and this will just allow for capture um, if you're having issues with the bipole. We'll just keep on moving here. Refractories and blanking, this is where you'll change your PVARP. Um, if you have risk of pacemaker mediated tachycardia, PVARP is going to be a big one here. If you have issues with atrial blanking, where you're blanking atrial events, you can mess around with that there. Um, and then just basic pace refractory, sense refractories, all of this stuff is here, as well as your PBC and PMT responses. Um, moving along, here's where you'll have your mode switch information. And this is just a way to... Uh, Oh, Jared, I just see your head. You have your hand raised, sir. Hey, mate. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm ha happy to wait to the end, buddy. Keep going. You're, uh, I don't want to break your momentum. All right. Sounds good. All right, I'll keep plowing through and then we can just answer any questions here at the end. Um, and then, like I said, we can uh, we can go over this more later. I'm going to be a go deeper in depth with defibrillators as well as CRT. But here's your basic stuff here. Um, <clears throat> alert notifications, this is how you actually set your alerts. Now, because you um, you don't have remote you know, monitoring, this, these are just more important when it initially prints out or you have an interrogation, this will give you your, uh, your high level alerts you should be aware of. You can customize any of these, say for example, if you wanna have, um, you don't care unless it's 20 cycles of a high ventricular rate, you can make those changes there. Same thing with AFib. Um, you can also just turn them off. So if we know we have an issue with certain things, we can just flip those off. Uh, v pacing percentage, if we know the patient is dependent, we're pacing all the time, we probably don't need an alert for that. So alerts, you just use your, your common sense on that, um, but that's just a good way of going through it. Next, we'll go to our episode settings. Here's where you'll actually program your EGM storage. Um, one thing that I, you'll hear me harp on about if we ever program stuff together is always have a far field channel here. Uh, just so you have the ability to see what's going on um, and discriminate between different kinds of arrhythmias. Um, near field can be kind of confusing for the human eye. So I always have a far field and then I have an A-sense amp and a V-sense amp. Um, these aren't the best for the human eye to look at A-sense and V-sense, but if you ever send it away to tech services to analyze the actual strip, they need to see what the device itself saw, which is why you have the A-sense amp, V-sense amp for that. Um, this will give you what the actual device is seeing um, unfiltered. And then the unipolar tip will give you a nice far field of what's going on across the entire heart. Um, max storage, all those things. I mean, I usually don't change that specifically, but I do program that. As you can see here, every time I hit program, it gives me the ability to preview if I make changes. So for example, if we don't want a bunch of AMS detection, I change this to ATAF. Preview will show me what I'm actually changing because it doesn't just change that, it also changes related things as well. If I like it, I can hit program or I can hit start temporary, which will temporarily hit it before I permanently program it. Um, <clears throat> episode triggers, if we know they have a little bit of AFib, I typically go to ATAF because it gives me less um, EGM so I don't drown in those. And you can set your priority here as well. So if you're not as concerned with atrial, but you still want them, you can set it to low. Um, or you can just turn it off completely. Uh, high ventricular rate, I recommend keeping that high. PMT, I like to have that on as well. Um, noise reversion, I like to have that on just in case there's noise, we're picking it up and I can take a look at it. Magnet response, I could care less if this device saw a magnet. Uh, so I usually turn that off. So here's where you'll go and you can either program there or that screen or program. If you don't like those programming settings, you can do undo all last, it will undo the last setting that you changed. Um, under preview, you have the ability to undo all of those changes as well that are highlighted. Finally, custom sets. You may have a custom set already created. If not, you can save a new parameter set and it will give you the option to name it. Um, but in this case, we want this one here. We can load that custom set and it will um, load up everything based upon that custom. If you look through here, 
everything highlighted in green is what's about to be programmed. It's a good idea to go ahead and look at this first before you hit program um, preview. You can undo all, like I said, or you can just hit program here. This will go ahead and um, lock everything in place. I always recommend reviewing it before you program any custom set because say the threshold was two and a half, but if this patient's threshold is three, you're not gonna capture and it could be very um, detrimental to the patient. So just to keep that in mind, finally, MRI settings, if you ever need a temporary program, DOO, things like that, that's how you get to your MRI mode, but just ask us if you have questions on that. Finally, the wrap up will be the, uh, the final view of everything you've done, kind of gives you a summation, um, shows you all the changes you've made throughout the entire process. They are in alphabetical order, so they don't make sense. If you look at the list, they're not like putting related programming together. It's all just alphabetical. Here's where you can select the reports you want to print. So when you do an implant, I, um, I think that it would be a good idea for you to back this all up to PDF. So in this case, say this was a new implant, I would just get my test results, my parameters, if there were AGMs, but it's a new implant, that's unlikely. And then we'll go ahead and hit print. This will generate a report for us. And then this report can be exported via PDF. So in this case, what you can do is take a USB. As you can see, it generated a new PDF report here. You're going to plug the USB into the side, into one of those USB ports. You're going to click right here, and you're going to hit export most recent and export. And this will go ahead and put the most recent events onto a thumb drive. Um, you can have it set to go as one file and multiple files in a folder. But um, the reason I recommend this is just because, you know, it, it might be a good idea to have other electrophysiologists review the programming. If you have questions and you're not as familiar, uh, you can always export it and have somebody review it by emailing it to them. So that's a good way to go about things. I have these set to do PDF only. If you ever need to change it to the actual printer to print, if you have paper, you can go to um, settings, printer preferences, internal PDF, and then print from there. I know I talked extremely fast through all of this. Um, this will be available on YouTube later on uh, within the next couple of days. So we can always kind of review this at a slower pace as well. If you have any specific um, questions, you know, we can, you can slow down and, and jump around to the, to the parts that are pertinent to you. But uh, always feel free to reach out to the group if you have questions on navigating the programmer. Um, you know, every one of them is kind of different, so it, it just helps to uh, to get as much practice as you can. I highly recommend using the demos if you have access to a programmer because that's where you can start to memorize how to how to get around as quickly as possible. All right, I, that's the high level. Why don't we go ahead and address any questions you may have? So I think Jared, you had something, and then if anyone else in the group has questions for me, please let me know. Thanks, AJ. Great summary, mate. That was really good. Um, got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. The first one, the, the two big, scary-looking red buttons on the programmer. Um, I've never, ever had to use them. Um, I was just, I guess the question is, why are they there? And um, when you do hit them, um, I assume you get a bit of pre-warning, like if you hit the shock button, you get, are you sure you want to shock? You get to select the jewels. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people... Don't want to accidentally press that button in fear that something may drastically happen. Yeah, no, that's that's a really good point. Um, so you do you do have the option to kind of bail out. It won't just uh, go straight to a shock. So sure. in this case, I'm going back to educational materials, um, and then I click demos, and then from there, I'm going to select the the gallant, um, just because it's a a good one to, to go with here. So if you ever need to navigate that, I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. I do not know if the demo actually does it. So I'll let sure, you know no here in just a second. But yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. So the shock button, uh, that is if you need to do an emergency shock and the device for whatever reason isn't, uh, isn't responding. Just keep in mind that you do have to have therapy turned on for that device to function properly. If the therapy is off, it's not going to, uh, to give a shock. Um, but then it's just going to go straight to a shock. Um, I've used this before for patients who have a defibrillator and they'd want to cardiovert them. They actually use the implantable device. I don't have a recommendation whether or not you should do that or not, because I don't have any data, but it's not typical to use an implantable device to shock for AFib. Um, they may use it if a patient is in VT or things like that as well to go ahead and break it up, but uh, still waiting for this to come online. And if this was so this a real is, patient, you obviously have to interrogate. Yeah, you have to interrogate the device first before you can hit these uh, red buttons. Correct. Exactly. So if you just hit it from the home screen, it's not going to do anything. You actually yeah, have to have yeah. a link with the device. Yep. You want to make sure your therapy's on, 
And then I'm going to hit that shock button and it says, okay, it's a demo. So tell you what, I have something here. Let me blow this up. Okay. So. Hello. Sorry, AJ. Yes, sir. AJ. Yes, sir. Um, If you are implanting, uh, you are in the procedure, implanting a device. Uh-huh. And uh, you are doing a CRT. You have yes, put sir. the you have the ROV uh, ROV lead before you put the before you put the LV lead and there is a shockable reading and you are you are using the melee your programmer to uh, to get the basic parameters and uh, uh, programming during the device mm. implant. Yeah, you do, uh, because I know uh, Medtronic is most of the device we plant here is Medtronic, but mm -hmm. you're uh, in St. Jude because you connect, you just press on the shock button or what you do to get the shock to, uh, to deliver shock when the device is not yet connected, you are seeing a procedure and you have a mm. shock reading. I get what you're saying. So you're not hooked to the device yet, though, right? The RV lead is not. No, you have not hooked device. to the device. You're yeah, in the, the middle the, of the procedure. You have a shockable gotcha. reading. Gotcha. So that's in that case, you're not capable of um, of using that shock. The shock actually delivers through the device itself. So um, if the device is, for example, outside of the pocket and you hit the button, your impedance level will be outside of range, and it will not shock to my knowledge. I've never actually done that, but okay. you should get okay. a warning from the device saying like impedance out of range, unable to deliver shock, but it delivers okay. through the device, not through the, the uh, PSA. So you have to be hooked to the device and the device has to be inside the pocket. The RV has to be hooked to the device. Uh, technically, if you don't have the RA and LV hooked up, it should still function, um, but you need to be hooked to the device. So in this but case- can you uh, give can you give anti-tricardial pacing? Via the PSA? Uh, through the, the PSA. Device. Not, yeah. I can't do it with the demo open. I have to plug the PSA in, but yes, you, you can give um, through a PSA. You no, during, during the implant. AJ, sorry. During the implant. Uh -huh. During the implant, you have yes. not connected the device. So you had, you have mm -hmm. ventricular tachycardia. You want to add the tachycardia pace the patient. Mm -hmm. Can you do it while through connecting the via the PSA? Yes, you can. Um, so it, what I typically will do for, a, for an implant, mm -hmm. I will interrogate the device itself, and then I'll switch to the PSA. So I'll interrogate the device, even though the device isn't hooked to anything, because I want to make sure that everything looks good. There's no issues with the device. It's not in some sort of backup mode. So always interrogate a device before implant if you absolutely can. And then because I usually use remote telemetry, I don't use induction. I usually use Bluetooth or RF. Okay. I leave the connection running. And then I go to mm. tools and then I go to PSA. Um, for pacemakers, you definitely either want to disable, um, there's a little screen to disable RF telemetry, um, or you want to move mm. to the PSA, which suspends RF telemetry while you're in the PSA. The reason being you have that yeah. power of remote RF. And when that's gone, it's gone and you can interrogate the device or you can't use okay. RF to, to talk to the device. You have to use induction only, which is limiting um, because mm. if you have an open pocket, you have to have it in a wand sleeve and things like that. So interrogate the device first. Um, and then do, I usually do like my preset programming. So a defibrillator will come with all of its settings off, tacky off, um, pacing off for an Abbott device. So then I go to my high output modes. Um, like I'll set it to five at 0.4 for my output. I'll maybe program my tachytherapy, but I'll make sure the tachytherapy is disabled because I know that you proceduralists don't like to get shocked. So I turn that off. Um, and then I'll go tools, PSA, and at the end of this, I'll, I'll see if I can get into it. But uh, from the PSA, actually, I can probably do that now. Let me. Uh, okay. Let me, uh, let me see if this button. Thank works. you. Okay, that doesn't. Thank um, you. So in this case, and what it just asked me there is if I want to enable ter tachytherapy and end. Um, be sure you don't do that before you hand a device off because it'll turn tachytherapy back on, and I can show you that again, but. In this example, I don't know if it's going to detect my PSA. Probably not. So let me plug in my PSA really quick. Uh, Jared, can you see my screen, the actual uh, PowerPoint in front of you? I can, AJ. Okay, perfect. So if you look at that PowerPoint, that's that's yeah. actually what the screen looks like there. Sorry, I just okay, hooked up my PSA. 
Uh, okay, you're a liar. Let me plug this in. So you can choose the okay. So you can choose how many what the jewels you want to deliver, and then so it's kind exactly. of a, it's more or less uh, like you said. If someone, if you're even in a controlled environment, it's a quick way of delivering a shock without actually having to go into the device and go to perhaps the EP EP stim and all that type of thing. So it's a quite a quick nifty way of delivering a shock. Exactly. So say like it, it's below the detection zone, you can go yeah. ahead and just shock without having to without change having to then detection suddenly, zones. Yeah, change rates and all that stuff. Yeah, it's more exactly. of a start shock. Yeah, cool. So that's that's how you do it. Um, if you're trying to break up an arrhythmia, you know, just do a lower a lower shock. Yes. Um, sure. One thing I would say is if your shock is too low, um, you could initiate an arrhythmia as well. So always keep that in mind that you could cause uh, differential, you know, levels of depolarization across the myocardium and then the patient goes into a dangerous arrhythmia so um you know you should maybe err on the side of a little more power but you're also causing damage to the heart so surface may be the better choice um if you ever need to bail out you have the ability to cancel and then mm -hmm. um if you ever hit the red button i don't know if you can see my screen here but if you hit that backup vvi button that'll bring up this screen right here where you put the emergency vvi um, one mm -hmm. thing it doesn't say here, it's going to be unipolar. Outputs okay. are 7.5.6. I don't know if that's 0.6 normally, uh, to be honest with you, but sure. Um, and then it's just like the basic refractory periods. This is just a very basic um, VVI setting. Say if we're having issues capturing, you can just hit that button and you'll be capturing as long as the device has the ability to unipolar capture. Um, cool. That would be my one distinguishing thing. Um, Okay. Thanks, Mike. So let me stop sharing the screen so you can see my main screen again. Um, so I hooked up my PSA in this case. It tucks nicely away. Um, if you ever, by the way, if you have an RF telemetry wand, when you have a PSA, there's not a place to plug in your RF telemetry wand here in these holes. So you're going to need this little adapter here. This USB adapter allows me to plug it into the USB in the side. Um, then you will plug in your induction wand here. Your pace sense cables will either use the disposable cable format or the uh, reusable Medtronic one right here. It will plug in to the green, so you match colors. And then finally, your surface e, um, EKG, ECG will plug in right here. And they directly translate back into the back of the device. So we have our PSA running. Um, if I had bad batteries, we might have a pop-up when I boot this up saying, hey, your PSA batteries need changed, which it may. I'm gonna go tools, PSA, um, if you're already interrogating a device, you can still do this in a real interrogation. If you're interrogating a device, it will not bring up this screen. So if you're interrogating like a Gallant, for example, it's going to automatically give you the PSA for a Gallant. Um, so it's going to give you LV or RA, RV, LV. Um, if you are going straight to the PSA, it will, you have to choose which one you use. So if you boot your PSA first, it's, you're going to have to, and you don't pick the right associated PSA with whatever device you're getting, you may need to end your PSA session, which could be very uh, not ideal if the patient is needing pacing support with the PSA. So if you if you interrogate PSA first before you interrogate the device, just make sure you select the associated. So in this case, we're putting in a Gallant. So I'm gonna select CRTD and start PSA. If I had selected that and we were actually using a surety, it will say this PSA is incompatible. Um, in this case, if you're using the Medtronic one, you know, it, it just uses the two options. If you're using disposable, you can plug the cables in manually. Um, I usually just use one cable typically, unless we have dependents. Here's your PSA here. Um, this is how you customize as far as like whether or not you want to turn pacing on or off. It's hard to do without a good example here, but a good indicator of greater than 4,000 means I'm not connected to anything. Um, <clears throat> pacing mode, you can customize the mode, but if you program it, it automatically changes the mode to VVI here. If I program it on here, it automatically changes to DDD. Um, if the patient's dependent, a lot of times I'm just going DOO, which means all of the all of these three are pacing no matter what. Um, and then I just have it at like a rate above, you know, um, say I'll set the device at um, 90 and I'll set this at 80. And then that way we don't have to worry about uh, getting inhibition because of Bovi causing us to not pace. Um, if, for example, Dr. Daffy talked about needing to burst pace this patient out, you can actually go to burst pacing here, and um, that will allow you to, um, you know, customize your S1 
um, your amplitude and anything like that. So for example, um, oh, this is actually, now that you mention it, let me go back, turn this to the eye. In this case, say we had an intrinsic event. I should have showed you this in the programmer. You can always take a picture here. It'll bring up the, um, it'll bring up a live, like a screenshot of freeze capture. If there were atrial or ventricular events here we're trying to pace out of, you can then show your calipers and then measure out the uh, the total time. So in this case, say we if we had a ventricular arrhythmia that was 320 milliseconds, we measured it out, moving both, moving the left one, moving the right one. Um, it'll tell you how long the it is in milliseconds. And then from there, say the arrhythmia, the V to V timing is 309 milliseconds. I can go here and set my S1 at uh, lower than 300 milliseconds, um, say like, I don't know, 280, something like that. And then we can go ahead, enable burst and burst pace. This will then, in this case, it's pacing the atrium. Um, this will then pace faster than the intrinsic rate, allowing us to hopefully gain control of, um, of the myocardium, the refract control the refractory and break up the arrhythmia. However long you hold it is how long it's gonna go. Uh, sometimes you'll get it in five seconds. Sometimes you'll need to run a whole screen, which is around eight or nine seconds. Um, but uh, those are the ways you kind of pace out. All right, other questions for me? Uh, yeah, mate, okay, if I, I had a few, sorry. Um, the other no, one you mentioned, you, you mentioned you didn't, you don't like the uh, AMV sense amp. My understanding is that is that also a bipolar, but how does that difference? How does that differ to a standard bipolar that you generally select during an implant? Yeah, so I will. I'll be honest with you. I'm not an engineer, and we could get one of our engineers to go into the minutia of it all. But uh, it is a bipole, but it's a it's an unfiltered bipolar. It's the bipole that the device sees itself. So if you look at the actual signal itself mm -hmm. this may not be a great example because it's a it's a demo but uh, if you look at an a sense amp signal it's very um it's very narrow and spiky like it's a very high let me see if i can gain this up this is a bad example here i don't think it's gonna be great let's see okay if you see here it's just very spiky amplitude um it's very hard for the human eye to discriminate this right here so this could be capture but a lot of times your own pacing artifact looks very similar to a sense amp signal to a human eye, just because we don't have the ability to, to see versus a bipolar will give you more of a wider traditional view of things, which is a little bit easier to discriminate capture versus non-capture um, or morphology, things like that. Uh, to the human eye, I recommend two bipoles and a unipolar is the ideal setting. However, if it's a new implant, I don't have a unipolar on here um, just because when they hook up to the device, it's just going to be all over the place because the device isn't in the body. So in that case, I just have, I'll have like an A bipolar, a V bipolar, and then I'll turn this one off. And another thing with preferences, I like to have A above V. That was just how I learned because I, I like to see yeah. the chambers independently. So I turn markers off here. I turn markers on there, make sure it's on full. Click back on EGM here, and then I'll put a bipolar. I like to see both chambers separately. Uh, some people mm -hmm. like to see them together. I, I personally, I think we have the ability to see what's going on in each chamber, and we should fully yeah, exploit great. that. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Yeah. AJ, wonderful yes, lecture. Oh, thank That's you. A wonderful lecture. Yeah. I am, um, you know, you are an expert in this. So, you have to take it uh, a little bit slower another <laughs> time so that a number of people can capture what you are uh, what mm. you are pointing out to us. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, no, I, I will definitely, this won't be the last time we review this at all. So sorry if I lost you, you know, um, I will have this on YouTube, but you can always, <laughs> you can review it yes. on YouTube, but um, exactly. we'll, we'll also go through it like slower. You know, a lot of this is just getting repetition and just seeing what's going on as, as many times as you can until it starts to, to make sense. I mean, it, every interface right. is different and just trying to take it in all at once is a lot. So we'll do another demo with the defibrillator and I'll go through kind of what we covered at a higher level and then get into tacky settings and advanced settings as well. Mm -hmm. So this won't be the last time. Uh, but yeah, sorry about that for running through it, everybody. <laughs>
<laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Great lecture. Any... The great lecture. Oh, thank you. Any other questions from the group at all? So next week, uh, uh, will Jara take his topic next week? Mr. Jara. Hello, sir. Yeah, you will me? you take your topic next week, sir? Yeah, what would you like? Your topic on uh, S, um, SVT, yes. Superventilator Tachycardia. Yes, of course. Next week. I can do that for you. Okay. Fantastic. Good, thank you. Perfect. Well, if there's nothing else, I really want to thank you, Dr. Dafe, for your for your presentation earlier. That was fantastic, and I I know that it's good. Thank to you very much to to cover that. So, <laughs> I, when you were presenting, I opened the Merlin here. Mm. I was following you, but you know, a number of us don't have it, so they won't follow. Mm. Yeah. So you well, yeah. So that was why I pointed it out. Thank you very much. Great one. You're welcome. Uh, you, yeah. Sir. I recommend just getting on those demos. Like I said, it, it makes it so much easier just playing around with the demo. Uh, when I was first yeah, learning, that's important. all I did is I'd spend, I just eat dinner and I'd play around with the demo. And then eventually you start to remember where everything is just in your head. So it's true. All right. You, yeah. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Um, enjoy thanks, the sir. rest of your evening. Thanks, AJ. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Thank Dan. you, sir. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, thank you. Thank See you, Jared. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, have a beautiful weekend. You as well. Yeah.